Good afternoon and welcome to yet another National Combined Grand Round on COVID-19 being held at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, in collaboration with Niti Aayog. We've been holding this Grand Round for now many, many weeks. And this week, we're basically going to discuss cancer in the time of COVID-19. We're all aware that COVID-19 has had a huge impact as far as our day-to-day -day life is concerned and as far as clinical care is concerned. But there's been a lot of collateral damage which COVID-19 has caused as far as other illnesses are concerned. We've had a huge setback in the, in the TB control program for one immunization program for the children has really suffered a lot because of the lockdown and because of various other aspects related to COVID-19. But one area which has really had a huge uh, sort of uh, setback has been cancer itself. And cancer has had a huge setback because of a lot, number of factors. Uh, one study, as a matter of fact, I remember in, from the UK, I think it was, which suggested that in CA breast, there has been now a decrease in five-year survival by almost 16%. And in colorectal cancer, that five-year survival has come down by almost 11%. And that's not related to delay in, or related to treatment per se, but even in delay in the diagnosis. Patients are reluctant to come, the, the interventions or the diagnostic tests get delayed. All of this leads to patients coming at a more advanced stage and therefore overall survival uh, becomes less. Therefore, it's a huge challenge for us to look after patients who have cancer in this time of COVID. And that is why we decided that we must have one of our uh, grand rounds on this. And the grand round for today is cancer in the time of COVID-19. I have with me an esteemed panelist. On my left is uh, Dr. Lalit Kumar. He's professor and head of medical oncology at the All Institute of Medical Sciences. I have uh, on my right uh, Professor Dean Sharma, who's professor and head of radiation oncology at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. I have Dr. Dio, who's professor and head surgical oncology. And next to him is Dr. Shushma Bhatnagar, who's professor and head onco-anesthesia and palliative care at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And after her is Dr. Atul Sharma, who's a professor of medical oncology. So we have a, a esteemed panel of surgical oncologists, of onco-anesthesia and palliative care specialists, and medical oncologists. And we have uh, uh, faculty and residents who will be presenting very interesting cases. Uh, we will first have the case presentation after which uh, 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 topic discussion, and then we can have your questions as far as cancer in the time of COVID is concerned. Uh, if you have any questions, you can send it through WhatsApp on the number which is at the bottom. It's 999-692364, That's the number. And we'll start off with the case presentation. The first case I'll ask Dr. Anuja Pandit, who is a faculty here, to talk to us on COVID-19 complicated by underlying cancer. So over to Dr. Anuja Pandit. Thank you, sir. A very good afternoon to all. I'd be presenting a case of COVID-19 pneumonia complicated by underlying cancer. So we present a case of a 62-year-old female, a housewife and a non-smoker who came to us with complaints of high-grade fever for the past 13 days, dry cough for 13 days, and shortness of breath for the past 10 days. She was a known case of systemic hypertension, and she suffered from multiple myeloma for, for the past seven years. She was receiving maintenance chemotherapy, and she was admitted for management of hypercalcemia of malignancy in a private hospital. There, during admission, she was diagnosed with COVID, and then subsequently treated with two doses of plasma therapy and remdesivir. Uh, 13 days after the symptom onset, she presented to NCI Ames, and she came. Uh, uh, con she was conscious and oriented. She was hemodynamically stable. She presented with respiratory distress with a respiratory rate of 35 per minute, and an oxygen saturation of 89% on room air and 92% on oxygen by non-rebreathing mask. Her calcium levels were normal on presentation to us. On day one, her X-ray showed bilateral lung infiltrates with multifocal consolidation. There was uh, left-sided CP angle blunting. Uh, on investigations, she, we found her to be anemic. Her uh, leukocyte counts were normal. However, she was thrombocytopenic with a uh, count of 46,000 platelets per deciliter, which gradually de decreased uh, over the next few days, but without any bleeding complications. Serum creatinine, uh, transaminases, bilirubin were all normal. Calcium was also normal throughout. 
Since she presented to us with severe disease, we investigated her for inflammatory markers. We found uh, IL-6 levels and ferritin levels to be drastically increased. Fibrinogen was also increased. However, D-dimer and procalcitonin levels were normal. On day four, she developed pneumomediastinum and uh, right-sided supraclavicular subcutaneous emphysema, bilateral lung infiltrates, uh, more so in the lower zones, and uh, left-sided CP angle blunting. Uh, suggestive of left-sided mild pleural effusion. She was managed with high-flow nasal oxygen therapy requiring an oxygen percentage up to 90%. Awake proning was also done while she was on HFNC. As a part of the management of severe disease, she received steroids, anticoagulation, antibiotics and supportive care. She was initiated with broad-spectrum antibiotic therapy including ceftriaxone and doxycycline. She continued to have fever along with high FiO2 requirement. She developed bilateral lower limb swelling, but DVT was ruled out. She was intubated on day five of admission requiring invasive ventilation. And she developed severe ARDS, pneumomediastinum, and antibiotic escalation was done uh, to piperacillin tazobactam and liverflox. On day seven, her uh, radiogram showed bilateral lung infiltrates, which had increased compared to the previous X-ray, suggestive of progressive infection. Bilateral CP angle blunting was seen. However, pneumomediastinum had resolved. Further, she, uh, her antibiotics uh, were upgraded to meropenem, clindamycin, levoflox, ticoplanin, dapsone, and primaquin to cover the cellulitis as well as uh, to uh, give P a PCP cover. She developed septic shock requiring uh, a uh, double inotropes and her cultures persistently remain sterile. She suffered a cardiac arrest on day 8 of admission and uh, she passed away. So the additional issues we uh, encountered in this patient was that she was immunocompromised since she was suffering from multiple myeloma, more so because she was receiving chemotherapy. Uh, she suffered from severe COVID pneumonia with ARDS requiring steroids. She had thrombocytopenia. She suffered from systemic hypertension, pneumomediastinum, and septic shock. Amongst the first uh, 4,200 patients seen at our center, we encountered 56 patients of malignancy, out of which 38 were solid malignancies. 18 were hematological malignancies with a median age of 47 years. 39 were males, 17 were females. Five were hypertensive, four were diabetics, and five were smokers. Six of these patients had severe disease. Out of those, four required uh, high flow nasal oxygen therapy, two required NIV, and one of them was subsequently intubated. Out of the six patients who had severe disease, five passed away with a, a mortality of 8.9%. In a, in a meta-analysis, uh, including 22 studies uh, studying the risk and prognosis of COVID-19 infection in cancer patients, uh, they found a cumulative mortality of 21% and a severe disease of 45%, ICU admission of 14%, and mechanical ventilation of 11% in cancer patients. On a double arm analysis, they found that the mortality, critical illness, ICU admission, and mechanical ventilation was much higher in cancer patients compared to the non-cancer patients. And cancer patients had significantly lower platelet levels and higher inflammatory markers like D-dimer and C-reactive protein, and they had higher prothrombin time. So to conclude, cancer patients are predisposed due to the risk of immunosuppression uh, due to chemotherapy or immunotherapy, and they have an increased risk of developing complications to the, uh, during their hospital admissions. And other factors which contribute uh, in impacting the outcomes is uh, the staging or the grading of cancer. The phase of therapy, the comorbidities, the type of cancer therapy they are receiving, the type of treatment provided for COVID-19, and the capacity of the healthcare system that is caring for these patients. COVID-19 infection can also impact the diagnosis and therapy of these patients, thereby leading to tumor progression and ultimately poorer outcomes. 
therefore there is a need to balance both covid as well as the cancer therapy uh, also diligent preventive measures full supportive care for immunocompromised patients to prevent or minimize the infection risk limiting their visits to the hospital and the use of telecommunication technology is imperative during the pandemic phase thank you thank you very much dr pandit and i think what she has shown is the challenges that one has in managing patients who are having uh, covid-19 and then uh, who are having an underlying malignancy and develop covid-19 infection this patient also had thrombocytopenia and you know that very often we give anticoagulants in these patients and there's always a risk of excessive bleeding which may happen along with that as she has shown the mortality is significantly higher in patients who have an underlying malignancy and go on to unfortunately develop a secondary infection uh, infection with covid-19 so before we go to the next case i'll just ask uh, one quick question to dr lalit kumar what measures would you suggest patients should do who are having an underlying cancer so that they can protect themselves from getting covid-19 because if they get covid-19 it can be associated with a very poor prognosis yes sir actually the for patients who are on act, uh, active treatment then one can take precautions like giving the prophylactic uh, antibiotics and uh, for the blood counts like wbc count we have gcsf which could be given and um, one can try we can modulate the treatment in such a way so that it does not affect the uh, outcome plus we are able to i uh, can uh, doses can be reduced based on the severity and the condition of the patient so some of these measures can be of helpful i think these are helpful along with that all patients who have an underlying malignancy should get some ed education as far as infection control practices are concerned it's very important for them to be careful in terms of exposure so wearing a mask uh, maintaining physical distancing hand washing becomes even more important for people who have an underlying malignancy because for them if they get covid-19 it can lead to a much higher mortality uh, we'll move on to the next case which is also trying to highlight again issues as far as cancers are concerned and this is basically radiotherapy in a patient with covid-19 and this will be presented by uh, uh, one of our faculty in uh, radiation department of uh, radiation oncology dr ramba pande so dr ramba pande you, uh, on to you for the next case thank you sir so i am going to present a case of carcinoma cervix patient who became positive during the radiotherapy treatment so this was a 56 year old postmenopausal multiparous woman with no comorbidities presented to our department on 8th august 2020 with complaints of discharge per vagina for one month duration pain abdomen one month and burning maturation for 15 days so on clinical examination patient had a 4 into 4 cm growth involving the cervix and the bilateral parametria not extending to the lateral pelvic wall This was a CT image of the patient which showed growth involving the cervix with bilateral parametrial involvement not up to the pelvic wall. Biopsy was moderately differentiated squamous cell carcinoma and rest of the investigations were within normal limit and a final diagnosis of carcinoma cervix figure stage 2b was established. The patient was planned for radical chemo radiation which consisted of external beam radiotherapy 50.4 gray in 28 fractions over 5.5 weeks with concurrent chemotherapy cisplatin 40 mg per week per meter square per weekly followed by intracavitary bracket therapy 7 gray into 3 fraction on weekly interval so this diagram depicts the entire treatment protocol of this patient where external beam radiotherapy will be completed completes at 5.5 weeks and this is followed by icrt on weekly interval on week 6 7 and 8 and the entire treatment is completed within 56 days or 8 weeks of treatment so the patient completed the entire radiotherapy external beam radiotherapy by 30th of september and we don't do any covid test before external beam radiotherapy as external beam radiotherapy is delivered as an outpatient department uh, treatment and this is prolonged over a period of 5 to 6 weeks so uh, after the completion of external beam radiotherapy the patient was due for bracket therapy and this intracavitary bracket therapy involves insertion of an applicator in the uterus and vagina like any other surgical procedure this is performed in ot under anesthesia or under sedation 
so covid 19 test before icrt is mandatory so the patient underwent covid 19 test on 30th of september and she tested positive for it so brachytherapy was deferred and the patient shifted to covid facility Currently, she is stable and asymptomatic. The repeat COVID test has been done on 13th of October and the report is still awaited. So at this point of time, as this was the first case of carcinoma cervix who tested positive during treatment, we had certain concern in our mind that treatment interruption due to COVID-19 infection can prolong the overall treatment time. This delay can impact local control and survival in carcinoma cervix. Treatment prolongation beyond eight weeks compromises local control and survival by 1% per day. Performing brachytherapy in a COVID-infected patient is also a big challenge. So the possible option under current circumstances were omit brachy and switch over to further external beam radiotherapy, delay brachy till patient becomes COVID negative, perform brachy without any delay or delay brachy, but not beyond eight weeks, even if she tests positive with modified brachy dose schedule. So the first three options, like omitting brachy and switching over to further external beam radiotherapy was not advisable as far as the carcinoma cervix is concerned. Delay brachy till patient becomes COVID negative is also not advisable as this can lead to decreased local control and overall survival. Performing brachy without delay is also not advisable in our case because this will lead to increased rate of infection to the healthcare professional as well as the fellow patients. So we decided to delay brachy, but not beyond eight weeks, even if she tests positive with some modification in the brachytherapy schedule, which will involve seven gray into three fraction in single application over one day rather than weekly fractionation of brachytherapy. So this is our situation where the patient has tested positive for COVID-19 after external beam radiation. 12 days has passed and we have done the COVID test and report is still awaited. So at this point of time, our decision is to go ahead with the treatment if the patient tests negative and complete the treatment by eight weeks. If she tests positive, then also we are going to do the ICRT in single application, delivering three fraction over a day, so that the treatment is completed within eight weeks or 56 days with proper precaution or uh, proper PPE. So this was a case report which was published by Mark et al. from University of Columbia, where they had done a brachytherapy in a COVID positive carcinoma cervix patient without any detrimental effect on the disease process. We also look for international guidelines where uh, American Brachytherapy Society guidelines suggest that brachytherapy should be done in uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic patient in a COVID negative patient with altered fractionation. If the patient tests positive for COVID-19, then also if resources available, we should continue brachytherapy with proper PPE precautions. However, if resource is not available, then it can be delayed till 10 to 14 days post recovery of infection and try to increase the dose of brachytherapy by five gray cumulative dose for each week delay provided OR constraints can be met. So the take home messages in this case was intercurrent COVID-19 infection may interrupt the course of RT and might compromise clinical outcome. RT should be resumed as soon as possible with modified dose schedule to complete the RT within prescribed time period that is within eight weeks. The dilemma exists for asymptomatic COVID positive patients regarding brachytherapy procedures. The brachytherapy should not be replaced by external beam radiotherapy options like IMRT or SBRT as it has been not beneficial in case of carcinoma cervix. Brachytherapy can be performed in asymptomatic COVID positive patient with proper precaution. Certain changes in the radiotherapy practice may be the need of our to decrease the risk to the healthcare professional and other patient, which includes altered fractionation regimen of external beam radiotherapy such as hypofractionation, altered fractionation regime of brachytherapy that is multiple fraction during single application or reducing the number of fraction, use of sedation or local anesthesia instead of GA while performing the brachytherapy procedures. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Amma Pandey. I think you highlighted the challenges that you have once you're giving radiotherapy and a patient in between uh, 
comes out to be positive. This patient was on brachytherapy also. So I have just two questions I just wanted to ask uh, Dr. D.N. Sharma. One was, do you think there is, during COVID-19, an increase in the demand of radiotherapy as compared to other forms of treatment for cancers? And how much modification of protocol like had to be done for this patient is being done routinely during this era of COVID-19 uh, uh, yeah, because patients are turning out to be COVID positive. It's something that we're having to do frequently or it's something that is not that frequent. Thank you, sir. Uh, there has been a surge of cases um, since there was a point when the surgeries were not being performed. And uh, even the uh, guidelines suggested surgery for these patients, but they were not taken up uh, due to uh, the reasons uh, of the COVID. So there was a surge in the months of April, May, and part of June when we had cases, uh, even in early stages, and we had to uh, accommodate them somehow by modifying certain protocols. The second part of the question uh, is that, uh, how did we modify the protocols? The first thing that we uh, resorted to the hyperfractinate schedules, which means shortening the treatment within the defined or the prescribed um, uh, ethical limits uh, so that we can finish uh, the treatment in a quicker time and we can accommodate more patients. Uh, the same was done for brachy also, that uh, we can accommodate more patients uh, where the brachy is mandatory, like in carcinoma cervix. So these were the modifications we have done um, uh, as per the internal guidelines. Uh, regarding the modifications uh, due to the surge in cases uh, due to lack of surgery during that point of time. Thank you very much. We will now move on to the next case and I think one of the most important issues is how to do surgery in a patient who has an underlying malignancy and has, in the time of COVID. How frequently should you test this patient? What should you do after surgery in the post-operative period? And uh, if the patient does become positive, then how do you manage this and what are the risks as far as the surgeon all the healthcare workers are concerned. So we have uh, uh, Dr. Sandeep, who's a faculty in the Department of uh, Surgical Oncology, who will be presenting cancer surgery in a patient with COVID-19. Over to Dr. Sandeep. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I will be discussing about the management of a patient of carcinoma esophagus in a pandemic situation. As we all know that uh, delay in the cancer treatment can affect the prognosis as well as survival of the patient. Uh, COVID pandemic has affected the cancer care services all over the world and surgery and anesthesia are considered to be high-risk intervention during the COVID pandemic. Most of the cancer surgeries are considered uh, uh, emergent, urgent or semi-urgent. Cancer patients are more susceptible to COVID infection because of altered immune uh, environment in their body and surgery in COVID positive patient uh, carries a higher risk for morbidity and mortality. Various guidelines for cancer surgeries during COVID pandemic has been formulated. Uh, for example, status of a COVID patient, uh, pandemic, uh, whether the number of cases are being uh, increasing or decreasing or stable, availability of resources should be properly managed. If the resources are scarce, then elective surgeries should be curtailed. Triaging of the patient should be considered. And if uh, uh, resources are limited, then uh, higher tumor biology and uh, higher stage patients of uh, cancer, cancer should be operated first as compared to low stage tumors. Strictly following of surgical safety guidelines like wearing of proper PPE and preoperative testing should be done and safety of healthcare workers and cancer patients are of utmost important. Here we present our case. He is a 64 year old male. He presented to the GI clinic of our This he presented to the RGI clinic uh, in the department with a history of progressive dysphagia. Clinical assessment was done with CT scan, upper GI endoscopy and biopsy. Finally, the patient was diagnosed as a case of squamous cell carcinoma of the lower esophagus. This is the CT scan of the patient which depicts the locally advanced growth in the lower esophagus uh, below the level of inferior pulmonary vein. Uh, by the time the patient presented to Yes, yes, yes. 
when the patient presented to the department he was planned for new adjuvant chemotherapy and he was uh, given two cycles of 5 fluoroacetyl and cisplatin based chemotherapy also but patient was converted to definitive chemo radiation in april 2020 because of covid pandemic disruption of surgical services at aims advanced stage and comorbidities and locally advanced nature of the disease patient completed successfully chemo radiation in may 2020 Uh, post 6 weeks completion of chemo radiation patient general condition was improved and dysphagia was relieved a response assessment was done with ct scan and upper gi endoscopy there was a partial response and uh, the disease has decreased the covid uh, situation was improved by that time and the cancer surgical services at the department was resumed and patient was offered curative surgical option with, uh, after explaining pros and cons uh, of the surgery the patient will plan for surgery Uh, this is the surgery we have uh, planned it is transthoracic esophagectomy with two filled lymph node dissection and gastric pull up and uh, this is a complex surgical oncology procedure which involves the uh, entry to the multiple compartment first we have to enter the right thoracic uh, thoracic cavity to mobilize the thoracic esophagus later midline laparotomy is done and uh, stomach mobilization with formation of stomach tube is done and finally the uh, cervical esophagus is mobilized by the cervical incision and uh, remaining part of the esophagus is mobilized then esophagus is uh, resected and gastric tube is uh, taken up to the cervical uh, incision and uh, cervical anastomosis with the remaining stump of the esophagus is done This is a complex high risk surgery in the covid pandemic uh, pandemic era because of prolonged aerosol explore, exposure uh, anesthesia and critical care issue includes fiber optic bronchoscopy double lumen endotracheal tube intubation uh, prolonged surgery and ch change of vt tube during the procedure uh, all these uh, carries high risk because of the prolonged exposure of the airway of the patient to the health personnel surgical issues include complex multi field surgery which involves uh, uh, assessment of the thorax abdomen and uh, neck long duration of surgery for 5 to 6 hours for which surgeon has to wear a ppe which can cause surgeon surgeon discomfort poor visibility restriction of movement and dehydration of the ot team this is the attire of uh, ot team when we operate this kind of cases so i have to wear a full ppe over which we have to wear a uh, sterile gown then we have to wear a respiratory mask or n95 mask whichever is available then goggles and then we have to wear a sterile hood uh, as per our departmental protocol uh, pre op covid testing was done which was found to be negative uh, patient was admitted and uh, pre rehabilitation protocol were initiated transthoracic esophagectomy with two full lymphadenectomy and gastric pull up surgery was successfully done on september 10th operative duration was 5 hours and it went uneventful patient was shifted to icu for post operative management Uh, in post op period uh, on second day patient was extubated and feeding was started from feeding gingerostomy on fourth post op day patient developed atrial fibrillation and dyspnea which was managed in icu on eighth post op day there was a slight bilious discharge from the right intercostal chest tube and an emergent cct was done which was suggestive of thoracic leak an emergency re exploration was planned Uh, emergency re exploration was done on 18th september and on examination there uh, pleural cavity there was fibrous adhesions and fluid collections there was a patch of gastric conduit necrosis with leak in the mid portion of the conduit here we can say that this is the normal uh, stomach conduit it the leak was at the mid portion of the uh, conduit which is quite unusual so we retrospectively retrospectively uh, uh, assumed that it is might be due to covid induced thrombosis because covid is supposed to cause thromboembolic phenomena in the patients esophageal exclusion was done and post operative patient was shifted to uh, ventilatory support in icu but he was not maintaining uh, saturation despite high flow oxygen this was the x ray suggestive of the uh, infiltration in the right side of the chest in view of clinical suspicion a repeat covid testing was done which was found to be positive patient was shifted to covid icu at national cancer institute contact tracing and quarantine of high risk surgical and icu team members was done and patients and relatives were also performed this is very important to retrospectively analyze who were all the, the person who was exposed to the uh, patient while performing the surgery patient was managed successfully during the uh, uh, nci stay 
for post operative care care and uh, covid management a repeat rt pcr was done after 2 weeks which came out to be negative currently patient is doing well and is planned for discharge every department or every facility should formulate their own guidelines should formulate their own guidelines uh, depending on the facilities available and their resources uh, our department has formulated uh, and published guidelines for uh, cancer care surgery during covid 19 pandemic by this case we want to show the complexities of the management of a cancer patients during the pandemic period and this patient has stayed for almost 5 years with our uh, department and he has been undergone change in the preoperative management twice and he has been offered uh, one elective and one emergency surgery and he has been tested multiple times so the key points are managing cancer during covid is challenging expertise and facilities to offer multi modality cancer management should be available cancer te teams must be trained and ready to handle high risk elective and emergency surgeries during prolonged treatment and hospital say repeat covid testing is important availability of expertise for covid management are also critical so this is the performance of the department uh, and during the lockdown period we can see that in march uh, till mid march when the lockdown was not imposed we were performing surgeries at a low pace because of the uh, initiation of the pandemic but when lockdown was imposed in imposed in april we have performed only emergency surgeries and we are busy in uh, arranging the logistics and arranging for pp and uh, space allocation for uh, resume, uh, resumption of our services from there we have we are gradually picking up the number of the surgeries both elective and an emergency in our department so uh, at the end i would like to thank the various uh, medical uh, facilities available in the institute nursing staff ot technicians and administration of aims nci and irch thank you thank you very much dr sandeep for an excellent case and i have one or two questions which i like to ask uh, both uh, dr deo and dr shushma patnagar uh, dr deo two question that i had in my mind one was if there had not been a covid pandemic would you have been would this patient have been operated up front in the beginning or would you have uh, continued with the same treatment protocol that you did uh, right uh, at at this point in time and yeah. uh, yes please go ahead uh, this patient uh, actually there is a slight modification in the preoperative protocol he is a locally advanced uh, lower third squamous cell esophageal cancer uh, as per our guidelines routinely we use preoperative chemotherapy or chemo radiation in these patients but here we started with preoperative chemotherapy then converted into definitive chemo radiation that is the modification because of the covid pandemic we did in this case okay and uh... Uh, doctor, uh, one question for Dr. Shushma Bhatnagar regarding cases like this. The challenges that the anesthetist face during managing such patients because this is a long surgery, and there is always a fear of uh, aerosol generation while you are giving anesthesia. So, any special precaution that you would really try to, like to highlight as far as from the anesthesia point of view? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, it is challenging, uh, especially this kind of surgery where we need bronchoscopy, and when patient is re-explored that time and then in his ICU stay most of the time uh, he was breathless and uh, chest physiotherapy uh, aerosol generation pro generating procedure like intubation re we re-intubated this patient this is definitely a challenging but however with all the precautions because uh, we have now intubation protocols we have uh, we have made a chart in the operation theater so that every resident they follow the intubation protocol we have made the protocol for bronchoscopy emergency bronchoscopy bronchos bronchoscopy intubation so all these protocols are in place and this patient because we were expecting that he should have improved in first post operative day after re exploration but he was not improving that's why we suspected that we should do covid testing because there there is a possibility that and that is why he came out to be rt pcr positive we sent for rt pcr and he came out to be positive so that was the reason uh, because otherwise he was doing well and we thought that he should have been doing well so that's that's the reason that uh, x-ray was showing little this thing definitely it's challenging but if we follow the protocols and if we take the precautions i think everybody is confident in doing this thank you very much we'll move on to the last of the four cases that we have and this is focusing on 
hemotherapy in a patient with COVID-19. This again is a big challenge because these patients have to keep coming regularly for the repeated cycles of chemotherapy. And one is always worried that in between if they become COVID positive, how will it sort of uh, affect the overall treatment strategy? And this is to highlight all of this, we have this very interesting case of chemotherapy in a patient with COVID-19, which will be presented by uh, a faculty in the Department of Medical Oncology, Dr. Akash Kumar. Good afternoon, everyone. So we'll be presenting a very interesting case. This is a case of uh, acute leukemia who had a breakthrough COVID-19 infection. So this is a 32-year-old military personnel by profession. There was no comorbidity and he was He was diagnosed as a, a case of Philadelphia positive B acute lymphoblastic leukemia at a private hospital on 24th April 2020. He was started on induction chemotherapy with effect from 27th April. So this is the uh, uh, chemotherapy that he had already received. There were three courses of vincristine and donomycin, one dose of pegasparaginase and one dose of intrathrical methotrexid. On day 16 of induction chemotherapy, that was on 12th May 2020, he had complaints of low-grade fever, fatigue, and myalgia, and sore throat for one day. Uh, because of the pending, there was a high suspicion of COVID-19 infection, and he under underwent RT-PCR that was positive. The patient was referred to National Cancer Institute, Thames. So we admitted the patient on 14th May 2020. At admission, there was no complaints of dyspnea, bleeding from any site, or any fever over the last 24 hours. On examination, uh, the patient was febrile, mild paler were present, and the rest everything was within normal limits. So the point of care testing uh, uh, that we did was SpO2 was 98%, uh, chest X-ray was normal, and ECG was normal. The hemogram showed pancytopenia with the platelets of 23,000, TLCF 320, and ANCF 70. We also did a COVID-19 related markers to assess the risk of any bleeding or any further complications, mostly hematological, uh, D-dimer, PTA, PTT, CRP, ferritin, all were in normal range. So we categorized him as mild infection. So we categorized him as mild infection. Uh, uh, we planned a close mo vital monitoring and supportive care that was oral paracetamol or oral vitamin C and zinc supplements. So the, now we had three issues to uh, deal with. The patient had pancytopenia. There was an active leukemia disease we are encountering and there is active COVID-19 mild infection. So uh, at that time, uh, mind you all, in April, there was not much data that had come up. At that time, not even recovery trial had come up. So we were not very sure if steroid will be detrimental in this case or it will be beneficial. So we had a department mental and a meeting and we decided that we should go ahead with some form of chemotherapy. Uh, because if we could interrupt, then uh, the disease would definitely would have come back and then it would have been fatal. So we decided to go ahead with chemotherapy. With, uh, the, the, the schedule was individualized. So we continued with steroids and imatinib. We gave BCR on 18th May uh, as per schedule. However, we uh, withheld donomycin and L-asparaginase. Donomycin in view of a chances are very high uh, neutropenia and ls is because it is a known drug to cause coagulopathy. So in supportive care, we continued with uh, septron, acyclovir, antifungal prophylaxis and blood supports were continued. During the hospital stay, all symptoms resolved by day 7. The patient did require platelets and PRVC support. However, he tolerated chemotherapy very well. Uh, repeat COVID testing, however, was done uh, weekly that we are doing in our cancer patients mostly. Uh, uh, this is our center's protocol. So uh, the, for the next six weeks, the COVID-19 PCR was persistently positive. Uh, however, on completion of four weeks of induction, we tried to talk to uh, the patient for a uh, necessity of a response assessment, bone marrow evaluation, and uh, for the next phase of chemotherapy. How the patient was very much reluctant for any further intensification of chem chemotherapy. So we continued with oral steroids and imatinib. 
as you can see this is the hematological parameters during the stay the wbc slowly has risen up and so is the platelets repeat pcr for covid 19 that came out to be negative after six weeks that was on 25th june 2020 the patient was discharged on 25th on a tapering steroids and oral imatinib with a plan for remission assessment and further phases of chemotherapy at discharge as you can see hemoglobin was 7.8 tlc and platelets were recovered and the patient was completely symptom free so this is our take home message chemotherapy is feasible in So, uh, chemotherapy is feasible in active COVID-19 infection. Appropriate selection of patients is very important. Complete interruption of cancer-directed therapy may be harmful, especially in active hematological malignancies where disease is very aggressive. Mild and asymptomatic cases may be considered for therapy under very close monitoring. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Akash, uh, for a very interesting case. And... Uh, I have just one question that I'd like to ask Dr. Atul, Dr. Atul Sharma, who's a professor in medical oncology, that in patients who are asymptomatic and who are coming to IRCH regularly for chemotherapy, how frequently are we getting COVID tests done or should we get it done at all or should we not get it done considering the risk that is there? Sir, as per the guidelines in our institute practice, for the patients who are asymptomatic, usually we don't do the COVID testing for the OPD. We do COVID testing as per the IDS guidelines for the patients who are being admitted for the bone node transplant and other high-dose chemotherapy protocols. So as a routine, one is not recommending that for all patients who are coming for chemotherapy, if they're asymptomatic, we should really go ahead and do COVID testing unless they turn out. They, they are symptomatic. I think that's a very important message because often people keep wondering and there are patients who sometimes are asked to get repeated testing done, which to some extent becomes counterproductive and adds to the cost of the treatment per se. Exactly. So thank you very much. We will now move on to our topic presentation for today. And... Uh, I'll just again once more remind all the audience that if they have any questions, they can send it through WhatsApp on the number at the bottom of the screen. That is double nine double nine six nine two three six four. And we now move on to the topic managing cancers during COVID-19, which will be covered by Dr. Samir Bakshi, who is a professor in the Department of Medical Oncology at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. So, Dr. Samir Bakshi. Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> so I'll be talking about managing cancers during COVID-19. So when the pandemic started, cancer was considered as a high-risk background illness for developing COVID complications. And at that time, a lot of guidelines were made, but these guidelines were not obviously based on data and they were actually based on the personal viewpoints of the experts. But with time, we have learned that it is the advanced age of the patient, the advanced stage of the cancer, male sex, poor performance status, and associated comorbidities in the patient, and hematological malignancies, which actually predispose to the COVID complications. There is recent data that administration of chemotherapy in the last four weeks actually did not impact COVID outcomes. In the pre-COVID era, if we look at with treatment, there are more than 800,000 deaths occurring in India due to cancer every year. So if we don't treat cancer at all, we don't know how many deaths would be there. If we were to look at our cancer patients, they can be divided as below. Active cancer patients, those who have immediate risk of death if untreated. Those with early or locally advanced cancers, which are potentially curable, those with advanced cancer or metastatic disease and are suitable for palliation only. 
And we have another group of cancer patients who have been treated and cured, and they are off treatment at present. So let us see the questions that we all have in mind. Should cancer patients be offered standard cancer treatment as they were being offered in the pre-COVID time? Should there be alterations in the type of this standard therapy? And what should be the follow-up care of of therapy patients? So guidelines for surgery were developed from the Department of Surgical Oncology headed by Dr. Dio when and when to do surgery, when not to do surgery for various cancers. And the same has been followed in our department as per these guidelines. From the Department of Orthopedics, Dr. Shah Alam published the data on bone sarcoma surgeries. And we are proud to say that the team conducted as many surgeries as they would have done in the pre-COVID time. And not only that, 90% of these surgeries were major sarcoma surgeries. As far as radiation goes, those fractionation schedules are suitably modified so that the duration is shortened and there are less hospital visits for the patient. The brachytherapy services should continue except for the aerodigestive cancers. Now, those who are actively COVID positive, radiation may be delayed but not omitted. Specifically, if emergency radiation is needed for active bleeding, that should not be deferred. Now, what about chemotherapy? Now, the decision for chemotherapy depends on the intent of treatment. Are we dealing with a curative intent cancer, like a blood cancer, or a palliative intent cancer, where an example being a metastatic bone tumor? The other thing that we have to keep in mind is what will be the degree of benefit for a curative intent treatment? For example, in an adjuvant treatment after surgery, in a localized bone sarcoma, we know that the addition of treatment would make a huge difference and not that much of a difference if it was a localized soft tissue sarcoma. So if it's a curative intent treatment, we would like the treatment to continue, but we would like to make a lot of alterations if our intent was palliative. Coming to the alterations that we have made and developed guidelines, one is the increased use of growth factors. This would decrease the neutropenia and perhaps decrease hospital visits as well. We have also shortened the duration of therapy. For example, a treatment which we would otherwise give over five days, we have condensed it over three days so that the hospital visits and the potential exposure to COVID may be reduced. We have also looked at alternative treatments without affecting outcomes, such as looking for oral therapeutic agents in place of intravenous therapies. We have developed various guidelines from our center, some exclusively from our center and some in collaboration with various other centers across the country for various cancers. Coming to an important point, fever management in cancer. Now, COVID can cause fever, so can cancer and so can the chemotherapy which we use can also cause cancer. So our protocol is we segregate the patients early, we rule out COVID, we keep a low threshold, but we must remember that even if this patient turns out to be COVID positive, do not forget to manage simultaneous febrile neutropenia complications, which could be due to the chemotherapy in addition to COVID. Coming to the palliative intent therapy, the word palliation means that we need to give comfort care. We need to make their life as comfortable as possible. And a lot of chemotherapy is used with palliative intent as well. But we must keep in mind when the logistics were curtailed, when the logistics were affected, the hospital visits were very difficult for patients. And we were not sure 
how much palliation we would get if intravenous therapy was used with a difficult hospital visit. We have also used a lot of oral metronomic chemotherapy in palliative intent patients and this is in line with our previous publication from our center where it has been an effective mode of treatment for solid tumors. Coming to another point, telemedicine and shared care. Generally, cancer care has been in major cities or tier two cities, but the but with COVID, we have made efforts to practice telemedicine specifically for off-therapy cancer patients and those who are getting oral therapy. And we have tried to build in a shared care model. And we think this is a healthy legacy of this pandemic. We have published this data as well, and we believe this will probably continue even once the pandemic subsides. The take-homes are... Treat curative intent malignancies with minor modifications as treatment for these diseases would add life years. And also, if we don't treat these cases, the curative intent would treat into palliative intent for these patients. The palliative intent patients need modified oral forms of therapy in view of the constrained logistics. There are also new research opportunities which such as evaluating modifications in standard therapy to see if they are truly non-inferior, evaluating various oral modes of therapy which curtail hospital visits, and bringing telemedicine and shared care models of therapy into routine practice even after the pandemic subsides. I would like to acknowledge our hospital administration which has managed the patients so effectively during this pandemic and the entire staff of AIMS and the Cancer Center. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Samir Bakshi, for an excellent presentation. We have a number of questions, and I'll uh, start with the first question, which I'll address both to Dr. Lalit Kumar and Dr. Deo. And this is a question which one of the uh, persons, uh, doctors has asked, that how has COVID-19 affected the screening program as far as cancer, as far as cancer is concerned? And what do you think will happen after the pandemic for cancer screening? Yes, there has been uh, some concerns that the, particularly the common cancers like oral cancer and breast cancer and cervix cancer, that the current uh, government program which was being run for these three common cancers in the almost uh, <clears throat> more than 150 districts in the country has been put on hold due to this uh, COVID uh, thing. So one, one can always argue that uh, you probably will be delaying some of the cases. But I would say that uh, like those patients who have some symptoms and they can go to the nearby physician and they are able to suspect, then they can undergo the proper uh, investigations and should probably should not uh, delete that much. Uh, I think that's a challenge because we have to do a lot of catching up, if I may put it that way. Dr. Deo. Absolutely, sir. That's uh, preparing for the future. I think we are still grappling with handling the current pandemic, but we need to prepare for the future also. Right. Uh, we have now data available from Western countries where the standard national level screening programs have got disrupted for common cancers like breast, colorectal, and heart attack. We have data available. And most of these patients are likely to now they are in a better situation. They understood there was a fear of unknown at the beginning of the pandemic. Now the patients have started coming back to cancer centers. So the resuming surgeries and elective treatments is one challenge. And preparing for the increased cancer patient load, I think we need to start thinking strategized from, I think, now for the future increased cancer patient load. Thank you. There's one question which is very specific by one of the persons in the uh, audience. And I'll ask that to Dr. Atul. Uh, that he says, I have a COVID positive patient with with the uh, metastasis, uh, primary unknown, and he has ascites. PET and CT scan has been done. Is it safe to taper uh, to uh, tap the plural uh, the ascitic fluid? And what could be the treatment strategy in such a 
situation so i think sir this is an a specific question so it appears that despite the pet ct scan and other studies probably the primary is unknown so if we need to do the tapping that can can be done without much fear but the only thing is that the person who is doing it whether ultrasound guided or so they need to have the full at least the level uh, pp uh, in with taken precautions that is number one the sampling should be sent for the immunohistochemical marker or the cell block and then they can do the inc so that they can find out what is the primary site so that there are certain cancer which even with the advanced in like if this is an ovarian cancer with the ascites then probably they respond very well to the chemotherapy so that should be undertaken had it been the after the some immunohistochemical mark and some gi cancer then the treatment directed to that can be done if this is a gallbladder or pancreatic cancer then we expect the prognosis unlikely to be good so we can send or refer for the best support to palliative palliative care so these are very important aspect thank you very much and i'll just like to say that we know that all secretions can also be infectious so therefore even if you do an acytic tap take all precautions because the virus may also be present in the acytic fluid and therefore you must also inform the lab accordingly uh, there is one interesting question which i have for uh, dr dn sharma this is what is the role of radiotherapy in lung pneumonia in in covid positive patients Uh, so thanks to the person who has asked this question for uh, showing the interest <laughs> in a lot of the radiation uh, because radiation is uh, more uh, feared than its uh, effect for cancer treatment you know uh, i won't be able to share the uh, details of the data which we have collected at center we have done a trial uh, but this is mainly for countering the uh, inflammation caused by the virus uh, if you see the uh, pneumonia is caused by the uh, cytokines released by the viral infection so in radiation low doses causes the anti inflammatory effect which uh, mitigates the pneumonitis and therefore it reduces the severity of the pneumonia and therefore preventing many deaths so this is one um, area where a lot of research is going on uh we have done a trial but uh, still going on and uh, we can't say the the details of the data because it's not, not yet published but the two trials which have been published so far each having only five patients so this is the largest uh, trial having uh, more than that and the response so far has been very encouraging and uh, of course the trial was very challenging but the response has been very very encouraging thank you sir thank you very much uh, dr sushma patnagar dr uh, samir bakshi talked of palliative care as far as the oncology is concerned but covid-19 has thrown a lot of challenges as far as uh, palliative care is concerned and the question is what are the challenges that you face as far as palliative care is concerned in this era of covid-19 and uh, uh, there is no reluctance of uh, patients and especially cancer patients to come to the hospital and take palliative care so how do we address that problem uh sir again this is a uh, true this is challenging because uh, many of the patients they are not getting curative treatments that's why they are becoming palliative and the palliative care clinics are full because all uh, these patients they are requiring symptom management and pain management so they are coming over there uh, to the palliative care clinic and uh, we are providing when patient is there but uh, it is also true that once you will give Uh, uh pain management or symptom management whether indoor or opd on the basis once they go home it is not that easy to come back so telemedicine is really helping and department of palliative medicine is utilizing telemedicine facility a lot and uh, these patients are getting treated via telephone sometimes we do video conference video video talk and we see the patient how is behaving with the medication and we advise uh, but definitely there is a problem that there are restrictions or on advising medication we cannot advise too many medications on through the, by by telephone but it is also true that once patient is on the medication we can advise to continue only thing sometimes those medications are not available for example opioids for pain management then they have to come then we ask relatives to come oh, and procure medication so uh, i think this way we are managing uh, but uh, definitely opd soft palliative medicines are overcrowded because of the advanced patients are going in advanced stage thank you very much this is another question which i'll ask uh, dr Sam uh, samir bakshi this is basically what is the experience with children who have malignancy and are covid 19 positive do they progress in a similar manner as adults do or do they behave differently do we have some idea on that so i think there is data that um, 
the patients who have had cancer and have developed covid their outcome has been no worse than the other um, non cancer patients at least in the pediatric age and um, so there is data that the treatment should not be curtailed or changed in the pediatric age group for cancers so it should continue in the similar manner yes there is no okay so i think that's an important point that you've made there's an interesting question which i'll address to dr atul sharma the, the the question is that considering the fact that patients with cancer can progress rapidly should we consider giving drugs like remdesivir to all cancer patients early even with mild symptoms it's a, it's a it's a question which i don't think we have a definite answer but the, the i think what so the, i think the like you correctly is, said sir we don't have a definite answer but probably only thing it with regard to the cancer patient like akash highlighted earlier we know that anybody who is on chemotherapy we have to have a very index suspicion low index of suspicion that somebody presenting with the fever which is a common symptom for the cancer because of the treatment and other ili or sari like symptoms they are many, very, very much common in the patients who are neutropenic also so these patient we probably need to act early and probably in one of the analysis i believe that the remdesivir has been shown to decrease the mortality in the cancer patient also but they are the established patient who have been given other covid treatment along with the remdesivir and other agents so i don't think we have a definite answer whether cancer patient should be started treatment early even if they have mild disease uh in a more aggressive manner and whether that will uh, change the overall outcome but uh, currently standard protocol would say that you would not treat them with aggressive treatment unless they have moderate to severe disease and many patients uh, there is a question on that also uh, may have mild disease also so i have one question for dr lalit kumar which is basically asking that uh, any act this is basically for you and for dr dev that in patients with active cancer and covid 19 any extra treatment that you advise once they are discharged or sent home uh, after having recovered from covid 19 yes yeah, so actually uh, i'll just modify this uh, to the like uh, type of the cancer actually the and the as it has been discussed that the, whether it's a early cancer or very advanced cancer so those like hematological cancers if they are young patients and they are in remission then generally you don't need really kind of any extra precautions except like what we normally recommend for the covid that your mask and hand wash and all this distancing and plus the obviously the about the the hygiene at home which they have to maintain so but the patients who are like uh, Uh, advanced disease or so called uh, who are probably beyond the preview of the so called curative treatment so there one has to use the supportive medication and there are lot of things which have been uh, kind of people keep on asking whether i can take this particular thing or with to immune booster or those kind of things so the data is still kind of fluid kind of thing we still don't have a very solid data for one or for the other but i will take if you take proper precautions proper exercise proper hygiene and about your food i think you should be okay so here i would like to respond is the dual challenge because uh, in the follow up uh, post treatment in cancer we look for any relapses treatment related toxicity but now we have now we have the challenge of post covid long term effects so the physician has to be very careful it's not only focus on the cancer but we need to look at the long term effects of covid also including pulmonary complications thromboembolic events so there are lot of uh, literature coming long term post covid effects i think uh, the cancer disease i am looking after at irch they have started a cancer history program to look at the long term outcomes <clears throat> uh along with cancer follow ups and covid follow ups now it's a dual challenge all the physicians and oncologists should be careful and keep a watch for long term effects of covid also i i, I may just like to add here like for example we had uh, just analyzed data on 16 myeloma patient multiple myeloma who were covid positive who became covid positive the first three patients actually that's the they were the, in the beginning the they were terminal disease practically the multiply treated refractory so those were the patients who could not make it next 13 patients they they could successfully be treated and discharged so they really had no problem 
two of these patients who have been discharged, they were having some pulmonary uh, lesions on the chest X-ray and they probably required oxygen therapy for a few weeks after the discharge at home. Thank you very much. I think I'll, a continuation of this which I'll ask uh, Dr. Atul Sharma is that uh, cancer is a hypercoagulable state and COVID is also associated with increased clotting. So do you think they should be uh, more aggressive uh, anticoagulants and again continuing with what we have discussed that should post discharge these patients we put on thromboprophylaxis. So I think, sir, we don't have the like many times for the cancer patients who are on some form or other form of the treatment, we do give prophylaxis in the form of either the aspirin or low dose heparin for the particularly with the myeloma with those who are on in immunomodulatory drugs and so on. Cancer definitely is considered is more prone for the thrombosis and this thing. But the problem with the cancer treatment is many of these patients, if they are treated aggressively, they have the associated thrombocytopenia, very critical thrombocytopenia. So if that is they are falling into the, that is platelet being less than 40, 50,000, then we don't. But otherwise, we do resort to this thing. As long as they are ambulatory, we probably we don't need to give the this thing, uh, these kind of the treatment. But if they are really bed bound or sick enough, then of course the prophylaxis and thrombotic treatment may be given. Thank you. Uh, one question for Dr. Samir Bakshi, which is basically, are there any specific cancers which are associated with the higher mortality? with COVID-19. Is there any data as far as this is concerned? So I think it has emerged that advanced age, advanced stage, male gender, these are the uh, risk factors for uh, increased mortality with COVID. There is an increased risk with hematological malignancies when they are not in remission and there's more risk of COVID-related uh, deaths. But I would also like to state that hematological infections or malignancies even otherwise if they get infected the risk of death is higher so if there is pneumonia even a non-covid the risk of death is higher so i would say other than hematological malignancies and advanced cancers i would not place any other specific cancer as a risk for covid related complications you wanted to add something, Dr. Lalit? Especially the patient with the relapse and refractory disease, they are more prone probably for the higher complications and mortality. And also, sir, some data coming for the lung cancer patients, they are at increased risk of the mortality of because of COVID. Organ involvement, okay. that causes a more of a problem. So there's one interesting question which I'll ask Dr. Deo because it's related to the case that was presented. Was RT-PCR done on the biopsy sample of the patients uh, with newly diagnosed carcinoma esophagus? And do you think it has any utility? Because you had shown that this patient had a post-COVID thrombotic uh, leak. Yes. So do you think to confirm the diagnosis, we could have done an RT-PCR? Would that really have helped? The tissue RT-PCR is currently not part of the routine recommendations. It is the uh, blood test, that's what we do. It is only the clinical literature which is showing. Now we have case reports, few case reports where they have shown in the post-operative period, the thromboembolic events. Uh, so that is just a presumption. We don't have a conclusive proof that this necrosis is because of COVID. So tissue RT-PCR is not part of routine recommendations as of now in the routine clinical practice. Thank you. One question for Dr. Uh, Atul Kumar, which is uh, basic, uh, Dr. Atul Sharma, which is basically uh, a generic question that uh, is it safe to do colonoscopy and a biopsy in a patient who suspected to have CA rectum uh, during, in COVID times? So, sir, if we need a diagnosis and this is probably taking all the precautions which we will be taking anyway for any other kind of invasive procedure, it is safe to do the colonoscopy or upper J endoscopy. But the bottom line, the, you need to have the adequate precautions. Sir, can I just add a point, sir? Because, uh, again, uh, there is some evidence that uh, COVID, uh, the fecal route spread is sir. also known. So, as Dr. Atul has highlighted, I think all the precautions should be taken, but colonoscopy and biopsy is, uh, routine, is part of a routine management protocol. So they should not be deferred. Thank you. So, another question which is related to the first case that was presented, and I'll ask this to Dr. Shishma Bhatnagar, that this patient had pneumomediastinum. What do you think is the cause? Could it be related to ventilation, mechanical ventilation, or could it be related to the disease? 
and is it known to happen with both this can be related to both basically uh in uh, covid patients we have to we need we tend to give lo, uh, large uh, high peep and which can cause pneumomediastinum and because patient was <coughs> already uh, patient was uh, in hyper means like he was in with the uh, all sorts of complication hypercalcemic and she came breathless and maybe uh, this was a disease related but probably uh, even a slightest of high peep can cause pneumomediastinum and uh, this is very very common in covid patients and uh, we have to we have to be very cautious and we have to be watchful on peep when we are treating cancer patient especially with uh, with the ventilation Yes, I think it can occur because of both. We do know that even with non-invasive ventilation, when we give a high uh, pressure as far as uh, non-invasive ventilation is concerned, that itself can lead to pneumomedial stenum and uh, surgical emphysema and sometimes yes. pneumothorax because of the peripheral involvement which happens as far as the COVID-19 uh, infection in the lung is concerned. Uh, so the disease itself can also lead it. The positive pressure that we give either during non-invasive ventilation or during uh, ventilation can also cause that. And the lung itself is uh, damaged because of underlying acute lung injury. So it could have hap happened because of both of them. One question for Dr. Deo, which is now with uh, the, the lockdown opening up and uh, surgery, be, like you showed, is becoming more and more yes. uh, being done. What what do you think would be the role of how do you define elective versus non-elective surgery in cancer uh, situation? And should we now start doing a lot of elective surgery which we had postponed or were looking at other routes uh, because of uh, COVID-19? Because we know that COVID-19 yes. infection along with surgery can lead to a higher mortality. Yes, sir. so that's a good question. I think the situation in March, April, May was different. So at that time, we were looking for mitigating strategies, non-surgical options. But we have learned a lot during these last six months. Now we know the COVID is going to stay. We know how COVID is spreading. We also know how to take precautions and protect healthcare workers and patients. So the strategy should be to resume surgeries, all surgeries. So, the, But that will depend on your resources, availability of resources. The focus should be on training your staff. That's very important, uh, including the class four, the nurses, the technicians should be trained. You need to prepare, prepare a strategy, then resume elective surgeries. That should be the motto. COVID is going to stay. We have learned. And if you look at the healthcare infection rates, uh, globally and even in India, uh, most of the surgical teams who are following good guidelines, the infection rates are not very high. If you take proper precautions, surgery can be done, even complex surgeries can also be done successfully. The Most of the physicians who got infected are primary physicians, general physicians at community level who are not taking proper precautions. So I think surgery should be resumed as early as possible, especially for cancer. I think that should be done as soon as possible. I think so. I think we have learned a lot over the last six months, both in terms of COVID-19, how it, its pathophysiology and the initial fear that we had for COVID-19 has now shown us that with proper precautions, we can actually go ahead and do a lot of uh, non-COVID related work. The initial few months had a lot of fear and people actually just everything came to a halt and many routine work uh, was stopped because of this. Gradually, we have to now start doing that. Precautions have to be taken, we have to be careful, but whatever we've learned, we need to utilize that so that patient care becomes better. So now we have the data available regarding the cancellations and delay of surgeries globally. This is a COVID surge collaboration from Birmingham. Now, if you see the data they have published, the cancellations or delay of cancer surgery rates, they were to the tune of 20 to 30 percent in Europe and North America. But whereas in Asia and Africa, they're touching 70 to 80 percent because it's a huge numbers. So we need to do a lot of catch up and the focus should be on resuming surgical services. Thank you. So this is a question which I'm going to ask both uh, Dr. Samir Bakshi and Dr. Shushma Bhatnagar. And this is basically a question which says, how do we look at follow-up of cancer survivor patients via telemedicine and especially if we want to look at palliative care also? 
So, uh, so Samir, what is your opinion on cancer survivor follow-up? How frequently, how should you do it using telemedicine? So, in fact, we are currently doing telemedicine for the follow-up care of our patients, the follow-up, the off-therapy patients. So, what we are basically doing is we need a certain number of tests that have to be done. It could be some blood test. It could be a chest x-ray. It could be an ultrasound. It could be a CT scan. And depending on the type of cancer, we ask that family to get that test done in their local center. And then they send the test to us by either an email. And then we respond. We get the files out. We get the previous data out. We see how the test is and we respond accordingly. And we also have a telephonic conversation with them if needed and if there is a specific doubt. So, and in addition, what we have done is a lot of the intermediary follow-ups, if they were to be seen after three months, we have asked them to follow with these tests at their local center. And if there is a problem, then they contact us. So that is what I meant with telemedicine and the shared cared models. So that was number one. The same way for a lot of palliative care patients, what has been done is that a lot of the treatment which we would have otherwise used intravenously. A lot of palliative chemotherapy is actually practiced for advanced cancers. That is supposed to improve the quality of life and maybe marginally increase the duration of life as well. But what happens is then when we are increasing the duration of life by few months, but if the logistics are so difficult that the patient cannot reach or has to reach with a lot of problems, then that whole issue of bringing comfort to patient goes away. We also have to keep in mind that if we bring the patient to hospital, there are multiple visits of hospital of, to the hospital for these patients and they don't get benefit. But if they come, they are predisposed to getting COVID and they also predispose others to get COVID. So we have to keep that in mind. And because of that, we have made attempts to switch a lot of these intravenous therapies to oral forms of therapy. And a lot of counseling is being done on phone. So that is the change. Dr. Sushma, you want to say anything about palliative care? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so these patients, those who are well settled on medication with all symptom management and pain management, I think we are following them on telephonically, tele telephonically on or on video consultation. But if a patient is not managing well at home with medication, we tr we have developed a directory, telephone directory for whole of the country, so that if he can go to the nearby hospital in the same district or same state, then we try that he should should go and we talk to the person that this person is under our follow-up and he is not managing well with the symptoms and pain management and we try to send the near, nearest hospital. If it is not possible that uh, the nearest hospital is not available and sometimes the people are in the area where there is no hospital, then we, uh, we uh, try to manage with the video consultation. We call the patient's relatives. And if at all not possible, like patient with pleural effusion and it's a huge it's tense ascites and there is no one to handle then we call the patient and we remove the fluid we remove the fluid with the from the lungs and the cytic and the patient get a little symptom management and then they go home so this is the way we are managing so telephonically video consultation is really helping and this telephone directory which we have made for whole of the country uh, uh, I think it is really making a huge difference. So we can send patient that you can go to the nearby hospital where the patient and we have a WhatsApp group for whole of the country sir, for this. Dr. Lady wanted to add. Yeah, actually, sir, as Dr. Samir said and Dr. Sushma said, we till month of August, 31st August, we have done about 752 emails which we communicated with the patients and what we have done like uh, those patients who were supposed to come on those days in our as per the appointment when they did not turn up so we called them back and then give send them the email by message that this every email you can send your card of copy of photo uh, photocopy of the opd card and then we have sent the prescription to them especially for the chronic myeloid leukemia so because this is the oral therapy and also for multiple myeloma when they have been on maintenance which really has helped to improve the follow-ups for of these patients now and especially like cancer ovary like whether we could give the oral metronomic therapy hmm. especially for those recurrent disease and that we have been able to do that so this this really was quite helpful
You wanted to uh, I just wanted to add one line, sir, because regarding telemedicine, there's a big Philip this uh, pandemic has given. Uh, so I urge all the audience to read the March uh, 2020 publication by Medical Council of India. The telemedicine guidelines, they have mentioned everything, how to interact with patient, what are the platforms, what is the ethics, what is the consent, what you can prescribe. So everybody should read that before they start practicing telemedicine. It's very, very clear. Uh, it is a general framework for healthcare in India, but we have also prepared cancer-specific telemedicine guidelines for ICMR. We have submitted the document to ICMR. I think very soon they will approve it. And uh, I think all the issues Dr. Samir, Dr. Lalit, Dr. Shushma has highlighted where all the situations it can be utilized has been highlighted in those guidelines okay final comment <laughs> so one more uh, important thing which we can do uh, if patient unfortunately is at the terminal stage then definitely we counsel them we ask them that they should not run away from here any other hospital because we know uh, we know the status of the if it is a matter of few days or few hours we ask them to stay back and we try to man manage their symptoms on telephone sir this is what we are so this is what also we are providing through telephones so i think the way we're going to practice medicine is going to change dramatically in the post covid era and telemedicine is going to play a huge role and that is why the MCI came out with the guidelines uh, way back in March. They are comprehensive, but they also provide some degree of advice as far as the medical legal issues are concerned. And it's important that all of us go through those guidelines as to the do's and don'ts of telemedicine. They, they, it's still work in progress. I think those guidelines have to be modified and made more uh, changed with time. But telemedicine is something that is there to stay. It has its advantages. It does have disadvantages also. But we need to really work in the current era where telemedicine will play a major role. Uh, I have one more question and I, after that I'll, if we, we will see if we have time otherwise I'll ask all the panelists to give their final take home message. This uh, question I'll ask Dr. Atul Sharma which says that is the incidence of asymptomatic COVID carrier more in cancer patients as compared to non-cancer patients? Any data on that? So the, it's, I, I don't think there's uh, there enough data to say so. So asymptomatic COVID probably carrier in the cancer. If you see the registry data from the previous month, March, April, and so, so they say the prevalence and incidence of the COVID or cancer in the COVID or maybe up to, to depending upon the what is the situation you are. Probably if you are talking about New York City or Italian, they found that six to eight percent of patient will have COVID positivity. If you go some other places, they probably have two to three percent of the cancer patients having. COVID positivity. So I don't think this data, I'm not sure about this, but the, the, the way, only way one could really look at this is if we did antibody testing in all the cancer patients that we've had and see how many of them have antibodies to COVID-19 but never uh, were tested or never were COVID positive. As we do a zero prevalence for the general population, maybe one can do a study and see zero prevalence among cancer patients and how many of them have antibodies. But currently, I don't think we can say that it is more in cancer as compared so to... I'm not cancer. saying this. There are prevalence study from the two large hospitals. That is looking at the incidence. Say, yeah, so 3 to 4 percent of the cancer patient will have positive. Here the argument is that how many of them will have be asymptomatic and have COVID with underlying cancer. I don't think we so have data We don't have that, that kind of... But it's an uh, interesting question. Samir, you wanted to add anything since you reviewed the literature, any data on this? Um, no, sir. I don't have information on this asymptomatic COVID in cancer patients. I don't. So it's, it would be interesting to see whether we can uh, uh, gather data to see. I think the hypothesis here is that pos does COVID, uh, the presence of a malignancy lead to some sort of an immune system that you, are, uh, you have COVID but you don't show uh, present with it and you t are maybe more infectious because the virus can stay on in that individual for a longer period of time. We do know that. Uh, or whether it's the other way around, that if you have an underlying immunocompromised state, you will definitely develop symptoms if you get COVID infection. Because we know that 40 to 60 percent of healthy people who develop COVID are usually asymptomatic. So does that also sort of translate to cancer patients? 
Uh, we can maybe extrapolate the surgical data. Uh, I can just share our experience of uh, cancer patients who are getting admitted and getting tested who are not symptomatic. So out of the last 400 patients uh, or patients we have operated, around 10 patients were tested positive who were asymptomatic. So that is the hospital-based data which we I think that the best available as of today. So they, we do see patients who are uh, asymptomatic and turn out to be COVID positive. I'm just wondering about the number because if you remember one of the things that we said that asymptomatic patients coming for chemotherapy don't need to be tested. So it has a reflection on that. So sir, we don't do, but the, there are many centers outside the AIMS probably which routinely practice this thing, sir. No, no, so we as, don't as suggest that. mentioned that there are patients who come for surgery and have underlying cancer but are asymptomatic. So it's possible that there are patients who come for chemotherapy, chemotherapy also, and are have COVID and are asymptomatic, and we don't test them. We don't, and we're not sure them. whether it has an effect on the outcome. So this is just a thought, actually. So one thought I would like to share that, like in many other infections, the antibody production may not be as robust as in a non-cancer patient Correct. because of the immunocompromised state. And that is the reason why the viral virus would stay longer. And that's why also the seroprevalence, we don't know if it will adequately pick up the patients because the antibody development also may be delayed or may be subdued in the patients with cancer. So that way the test may not be accurate enough to pick up what we are asking for because we may not have a robust That's antibody like There is some data coming up which say that the zero clearance may be faster in cancer patient other than the, rather than the healthcare work, workers. Basically there is a okay. data from France which say that the 15 days probably it's probably faster clearance in the okay. cancer patient problem. So I think as we go along the pandemic and as we evolve there is a lot of learning that we have and that is in various diseases including cancer and we've had a very interesting discussion. So as we wrap up, I'll ask all the panelists to just give their final take-home message and I'll start uh, with uh, Dr. Atul Sharma there, what, any take-home message that you'd like to give to the so audience? The, 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 the bottom line, the most important is that probably you can treat the cancer patient as they are to be treated in the pandemic also. You need to take adequate precautions. You also need to stress upon the patient and the family to have the hand hygiene and washing. So probably maintain the social distance. Do not mix with the crowd and take all the precautions so that they do not catch infection and they do not infect others. Thank you, Dr. Shishma Bhatnagar. So, uh, so I will not repeat what Dr. Atul has said. Uh, <laughs> uh, cancer, combination of cancer and COVID-19 is not good for patients, for caregivers, as well as for physician. But uh, now we have come, although it's only six to seven months, we have come long way. We have learned a lot that we can do uh, we can do a lot for cancer patients in every stage. In early stage, when they are curative, we can do something. When they are not curative, we can do something. And when they are in, in their terminal stage or in the palliative stage, we can do something. So we should be, after taking full precautions for healthcare providers, we should continue to take, continue to give, and we should not deprive a single patient who is requiring curative treatment or palliative treatment. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, so the picture is very clear now, sir. The mortality of COVID is 1 to 2 percent currently in India. The mortality of untreated cancer is 100 percent. So there is no need for a lot of discussion. The picture is very clear. We need to resume oncology services. Yes, there was a panic when the pandemic started, but we have learned our lessons and we have proven that it is feasible to do all standard cancer treatments with maybe minor modifications. The education of the patients, education of the treating physicians is very important. And the focus should be on resuming oncology services as early as possible. Thank you. Dr. Lalit. Yes, sir. <coughs> I think I would say that uh, people need not to be very apprehensive. That's the first thing. And uh, those who are asymptomatic, even sometimes COVID is positive, as we were just discussing, they need not to really worry. Those who are on active treatment for cancer, I think they should continue with taking all due precautions, as Dr. Atul has um, uh, emphasized. And those who are on the regular follow-ups, uh, they can... Uh, with the, some of the other methods, they can continue to remain on the follow-up and information can be provided. 
I would say that uh, in addition to this, in general measures like uh, take all the precautions for COVID, about your food, regular exercise, and positive state of mind, which I think will be the some simple Most things important. which will keep you fit and uh, healthy. Dr. D. N. Sharma, your, your take home message. Sir, there's a need to uh, modify the approach as far as medicine treatment is concerned, uh, especially because this treatment is a prolonged treatment. Every patient requires a visit of like five to seven weeks for the treatment. Uh, we have a risk uh, stratification for uh, approaching these patients. Uh, group 1, where the radiation is used as a curative modality, where the uh, radiation is likely to benefit uh, in a concrete manner. So these patients, we should not defer or delay the treatment. The second group is where the radiation is used as an adjuvant setting after the like surgery. The indications are depend, uh, dependent on the margin of benefit and there we can take a decision for either to defer or delay or even abandon the treatment based on the margin of benefit. The third category is the patients who require palliation and therefore uh, radiation is very important palliative modality and must not delay, uh, especially in patients like SVCO uh, and uh, bleeding uh, CA cervix. So these patients, uh, radiation must be delivered in time uh, so as to give the benefit. The also a message for the uh, radiation team workers because it's a prolonged treatment and they are con continuously exposed to the uh, patients every uh, day. And every day we treat like 150 patients uh, on our machine. So therefore the radiation uh, team is at a high risk so therefore they must take all the precautions required for the uh, for the treatment of these patients thank you sir thank you dr samir bakshi your final comment so i think i have two comments to make number one i think that telemedicine is a big take home from this pandemic that we have learned and we have to make our patients learn as well as we all have to get used to it and i feel that this will stay even after the pandemic subsides. That's one take home. And my second take home is that a lot of research opportunities have opened up for us. A lot of these oral forms of therapy may be as good, non-inferior to our current intravenous forms of therapy and they need to be systematically evaluated. Thank you very much. I think we've had a very excellent uh, discussion in this uh, a grand round on cancer in the times of COVID. We've learned that how important it is. And I think the important issue that has come out is that we need to move ahead. And when it comes to cancer, there is an urgent need to really come back to what was the pre-COVID era, whether it's screening, whether it's patients coming for testing, if they have some uh, suspicious uh, red flags for having an underlying cancer. And it's our responsibility now to really start restoring services as far as cancers or other diseases or other uh, illnesses are concerned uh, uh, for our patients. And as has been mentioned, we will have to live in a new normal, whether it be infection control, telemedicine, or trying to look at various strategies of uh, uh, being innovative in this time of COVID-19. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the panelists, all the speakers, Dr. Anuja Pandey, Dr. Ramba Pandey, Dr. Sandeep and Dr. Akash for excellent presentation, Dr. Samir Bakshi for really covering the topic and all the panelists who uh, spared their time for this grand round. Thank you very much and hope to see you next week for an, in, with another topic. Thank you. Thanks.